Hey Scavs, it's Mac and I'm back uh, much sooner than I expected actually. Uh, we are on the eve of the early access launch and Fundog just released another uh, developer Q&A earlier today. Um, so I just thought it'd be fun to go through uh, a summary of uh, what they talked about in this uh, latest Q&A. Um, yeah, I wasn't expected to record today, and I just uh, saw the uh, video drop on their Discord, and I thought, what the hey, let's give it a shot. So, without further ado, let's head into, uh, well, once again, I'm doing my top four uh, questions from this Q&A session. There were about uh, 15 questions this time. Let me see here. Uh, 15, how many questions they, did they do? Uh, yeah, 15 questions total. Uh, this time around, uh, I will say uh, the questions that they curated were not as satisfying as they were in the previous one they did last week. Uh, I just didn't find them as um, helpful for me as a potential player. Uh, personally, I guess I'm a bit more pragmatic about these Q&A uh, interviews. Uh, I just want to like get an idea of like what their design philosophy is, what their uh, thinking process is behind doing certain game mechanics or making design design decisions, technical um, issues, how the game's gonna run, feature sets, stuff like that, right? And this one is a little bit more fluffy, to be honest. Uh, which is totally fine, but for me, I just felt like the previous one had better questions. So anyway, the four that stuck out for me, I'll start with the uh, number one. Uh, somebody asked, uh, will you be able to customize your innard? So the innard is the base camp uh, in the game, apparently. So it said yes, this is a very emphatic yes. They said you could already invest in customizations for your base camp, I guess, in the beta build that's floating out there for content creators. So you can already do that to an extent. But they definitely want to expand on that functionality. Uh, they mentioned stuff like um, adding in posters made by feature artists. And uh, again, they mentioned the jukebox feature that they like to put in. And they also said they're toying around with like a firing range feature, uh, all of which sounds really cool. Uh, <laughs> funny enough, they, they mentioned that they're taking some inspiration from games like Animal Crossing for this aspect of the game. Obviously, it's not going to be as whimsical <laughs> As Animal Crossing, uh, I think the customizations you're going to do are going to be very uh, lore, like respectful of the lore and the and the vibe of the game, which is very grim dark still, right? But it's going to be a place where you can, I guess, kick back and relax and and let loose a little bit, right? Um, finally, they said that um, you know extending this feature is very easy uh, since it basically amounts to like a menu that they can just continually add to. So it's a very easily extensible feature uh, within their uh, architecture. So that's great. It's great to hear. So moving on to my second uh, highlight question is, uh, will progress from early access be wiped uh, when the game is fully released? And I was surprised by their answer because they said no. Uh, they have no plans for uh, what they said back to square one uh, reset. Um, they had some caveats. And you got, I got a sense that they wanted to talk more about it, but they were kind of vague. They kind of made, made references to um, character skills or certain things about the progression that may be adjusted. But in terms of like a clear wipe, there's not going to be a, a, a total uh, wipe when they move from early access to 1.0, which I, I found shocking, actually. So <laughs> we'll, we'll hold them to that. We'll see if that's the case. Um, so, okay, so the third question, uh, somebody asked, what sort of punishments are in store for griefers? Now, this one, uh, my ears really perked up because in my own uh, profession, I work at a studio and I've been involved in uh, anti-cheat efforts and, and policing bad behavior. So essentially, like, how are they going to police bad apples in their game? So they did say that uh, things like uh, abuse of the friendly fire uh, in the game. So basically player killers. If you're an excessive player killer uh, in the design, 
is going to lead to your uh, reputation within the game dropping. So factions within the game are not going to like you. I guess when you're back at your home camp, it's going to be harder for you to maybe uh, make friends and uh, make deals with people. And that's supposed to have, you know, very dire consequences for you as the player, which makes sense. But, you know, beyond that, uh, they kind of just said like, oh, you know, to avoid bad players or you know, people who don't want to people who you who, who don't want to play with pardon me uh you know make use of the in-game uh grouping filters and uh leverage your your own friend group and uh leverage i guess the community at large you know lfg sort of things right but uh that i was a little bit disappointed maybe of this answer um i think if they if they envision their game just sort of just staying very niche and never like going like super big, then I think this approach should be fine. Where the community is almost self policing itself, and there's going to be some built in uh, deterrence within the game's design that will incentivize good behaviors. Right. Once the game gets really big, let's assume that the game like gets to like a Apex Legends scale of success. Let's just say this is this may not cut it. <laughs> it's going to be too much, and especially um, with how the game is structured around peer to peer. This is the big question I have. This was actually not asked in this video, but this is a personal question of mine. Is like how are they going to deal with anti cheat? Now I know there's um, client anti cheat that they can make use of. This client anti-cheat within the game install is going to be, have to be pretty robust. Um, even though the game is not PvP, uh, the potential divide between a legit player and somebody who cheats, who, who's going to mod their game and walk around like a god, has that, that divide is potentially very vast, right? And uh, with a game that's so punishing and hard, just seeing a player that just mods their way through and they group they get into your group and just totally ruin your experience, that's not going to be great. That's going to just like really undercut the uh, overall experience of playing uh, Forever Winter, in my opinion. So when you have a server, when you have a game that kind of handshakes with a server, a lot of, you can put a lot of data on the server that's locked away, right? Um, but without a server-based game, everything is on the client and everything is up for grabs. So, yeah, I, I assume that client anti-cheat is going to have to do all the heavy lifting. And with client anti-cheat solutions, like those have been also known to drag down game performance too. So for me, that's a big question mark on how they're going to uh, combat cheating and also combat like... Um, abusive behavior, anti-social behavior, that sort of stuff. So interesting question, but just kind of leads into more questions, essentially. Final question, uh, the fourth question that stuck out for me as a highlight, uh, what are the main differences between the early access release and the beta build that content creators have been playing? Uh, so this one is a little bit vague as well. They say it's like night and day. Kind of expect them to say that. Uh, the main improvements that they highlighted were performance and network improvements, which makes sense. They also mentioned the systemic changes to things like AI routines and other uh, core game mechanics. Uh, but they didn't really get into a whole lot of details. It was just like it'd just be too huge of a list. Uh, so much has changed, but they do feel that like when you look at the game on their side of things and you look at the beta build that content creators are playing. The, the beta build feels so old to them. That's what they said. And uh, finally, to kind of cap off their answer to the question, they said, if you still have doubts, then uh, just wait for the demo that's coming out in October to help you make a decision. No need to spend the money uh, tomorrow uh, for the early access. So I thought that was very noble of them to, to remind, us, remind us of that. Um, so yeah, in closing... That's it. Those are the four questions that stuck to me out of the 15. Like I said, not as good of a Q&A session as the last one. But, I mean, I was still happy that they uh, put this out. 
the day before uh, early access is gonna go live. So here we are, we're on the eve of uh, the early access uh, release. Uh, I'm on the uh, West Coast, so my uh, game would be available to download at, what is it, noon, 12 p.m. Pacific. Uh, one, one final, I guess, note about that is that uh, this has been really exciting for me to cover uh, the Forever Winter, and I appreciate all the um, great comments I've received about the, the previous videos I've done on the channel. But you know what? This could be, this could either be the beginning of my regular coverage of this game, or it could be the end. Uh, because my PC is under spec based on uh, what the, like the stated uh, minimum requirements on the Steam page. It's my CPU. So I'm kind of kicking myself like six months ago that I should have got like eight core CPU, but I don't have an eight core CPU. So uh, I'm going to try anyway. Uh, Steam has a refund policy, still applies to early access games. If I can play, if I can play the game, then great. I look forward to playing with all the rest of you and sharing my experiences and my perspective and uh, helping to shape this game's future. Uh, if I'm not able to play the game, sucks. I'm kind of dead in the water. Uh, it's not going to be acceptable for me to continue uh, making content about a game that I can't even play. It's going to feel like I'm peering through like a, a peephole in a door. Uh, and meanwhile, inside, the party's happening. But I only see like a little bit at a time. And not being able to have my hands on the game is just going to be a huge deterrent to creating content, obviously, as a, as a gaming uh, YouTuber. So I'm just going to try again maybe uh, next month for the demo to see if they've kind of toned down the requirements by then. Or maybe some kind, uh, maybe a future version where they've really optimized and they're not going to require you to have like, I don't know, like 32 uh, gigs of like system RAM and, and an 8-core CPU. Uh, but we'll see, you know, we'll see. I'll give it a shot tomorrow and if all goes well, I'll probably do a live stream tomorrow night of uh, the Forever Winter uh, Early Access build. Early Access release. Uh, but yeah, if you can play it, um, best of luck to you. Hope you have fun and I look forward to checking out the other content creators that have uh, started covering this game and uh, getting a taste of uh, how this thing's going to unfold. This is all very exciting. Uh, if you um, like the video, if you watched to this point, thank you very much. Do all the great YouTube things. Leave a like on the video. Uh, consider subscribing to the channel if this pleases you. And uh, leave a comment on the video. I always like reading your comments very much. So with that said, I'm out. I got things to do. And uh, it's been fun. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye for now.